On this episode of the Dr. Tina show, I'm going solo and I'm going to share a personal story about myself. And we're going to talk about my thoughts around mold, chronic illness like Lyme and other chronic infections, long COVID, and what it all has to do with getting more resilient. So personal story, if you guys don't know me, I haven't told the story in a while, so I thought it was time to share again. When I was 19, I was pretty much living off of Snapple and Sun Chips. I was going to undergrad college. I was living away from home. I was stressed out of my mind. I was underweight. I was undernourished. I was chain smoking. I was drinking too much alcohol. And I was a mac and cheese -itarian if you will. I wasn't eating any protein whatsoever. And I was living off of like, I'd go to Subway and get a sandwich of white bread and artificial cheese and pickles. And I'd call that lunch. I got diagnosed with cytomegalovirus when I was 19. And what is that? That is actually a really common virus. It's in the herpes family. It's a sister to Epstein-Barr virus or mono, if you will. And most folks get it and most folks clear it no problem. And when you can't clear it, they wonder if you're immunocompromised. And they put me through a battery of tests and they were very concerned. And this was back in the early 90s. And they thought perhaps I had HIV. So they took a blood sample and did a test. And back then it took a long time to get those test results back. And I was on, you know, biting my nails and on razor blades in anticipation. And it turned out I was not. I just had cytomegalovirus, but I had such crazy high titers that they were very concerned. They forced me to unenroll in school. I convinced them to let me go part-time because otherwise I was going to go crazy. I had to move back to my parents' house and I spent, I don't even remember, it was a blur. It was months and months back at my parents' house trying to recover before I was allowed to move out on my own and be independent again and go back to school. And for someone like me, who school was like my um, you know, it was like my safe place. School was what I knew and school was what I was good at. And I wasn't ready to be an adult out in the world. And I really wanted to become a doctor. So my whole life. So I was really devastated. And I remember it being a very depressing time. What I didn't learn until later, when I graduated, I went to, I, I graduated successfully with a science degree. And I went on to work for my mentor, Dr. Rick Marinelli, who's a naturopathic physician. Uh, this always makes me tear up. I can't talk about it without tearing up. He looked at me and he said, you're not crazy. Because at that point, I really thought I was crazy. They had put me on a arsenal of antidepressants and had me in therapy. And he said, he just looked at me so confused. And he said, cytomegalovirus attacks your brain. You're not crazy. And I was just floored, you know, and it made me wonder I had had issues acutely starting when I was 15 with mental emotional stuff. And it made me wonder, had I been dealing with this for years and it had just gotten really bad or did I have an acute infection? We will never know. But I have since spent a lot of time studying viruses and studying their impact on the brain. And I will tell you that viruses do impact the brain significantly. And if you just Google uh, neurologic sequelae of influenza or ne neurologic sequelae of, of any virus, really, you'll find literature on it. And when COVID started, I was like, well, that is clearly attacking the brain. And we had literature on that early on. And we had literature showing that it was causing brain damage early on. I tried to share about it. Another big influencer that many of you follow came out with his own reel immediately after and was like, because, you know, people can't mind their business. They have to get really caught up and hung up on stuff. And so they send everything to me and they send everything to him and they send everything back and forth, right? Because people love drama. So obviously I had put out a blog post talking about this and it had stirred up the drama and he had to apparently feel the need to reply to it in his own way. And he came out and said, oh, COVID isn't causing brain damage. She's just trying to scare you. Um, well, we have the literature many years later, that actually is one of the main mechanisms they think of long COVID. They think that's what's happening. So that is happening. And I think it really did a number on my brain and it did a number on my affect, if you will, how I presented in the world emotionally. And I was not very stable during those years. It was rough. It was a rough go. And I look back now and I realize a lot of it was due to severe malnutrition, 
Um, it ignited autoimmune disease in me. So it put me into an autoimmune thyroid state, which sends you into a hyper, when you're young, you get a thyroid surge. And so you go hyperthyroid. I would get really skinny and really manic. And then I would go severely hypothyroid every fall. So that would happen in the spring. And then in the fall, I would dump out again and I'd go hypothyroid. Only no one was diagnosing me at correctly because I didn't have access to any functional medicine practitioners at the time. This was before I met my mentor. And I would go hypothyroid, I'd get very depressed, I'd gain a bunch of weight, and so this cycle would go. And I had a whole closet full of clothes from size four to size 10, and I would just swing, sometimes size 12, I would just swing back and forth. And it was not fun, and when I met my mentor, he really got me on the path, you know, he I would he told me to quit smoking immediately. He helped, he helped me with that with acupuncture. I had acupuncture, auricular acupuncture, and that was really helpful. He got me exercising to some degree. Um, he he really helped me navigate and he saved my life. And so I will tell you though, I didn't do much with it. I spent another, I mean, gosh, what that was when I was in my mid twenties and it wasn't until my early thirties that I really got my shit together, guys. I had a baby right up in there. Uh, I had a baby actually at 25, not in good health whatsoever. Still, even though I had been working for him, I, I wasn't listening. I wasn't you know, a lot of damage had been done at that point. So I just wasn't coming around quickly. I was slow to the advice, if you will. I'm sure very frustrating to him. And I, you know, I had a baby and she, I, I feel like my daughter probably has, um, that makes me cry too. <laughs> I feel like she has really struggled throughout life because I was not in great health when I can, you know, was pregnant with her, carrying her and conceived her. And it was a really difficult birth. And, uh, she ended up in the NICU and I ended up in surgery and, um, it, it just was, a, it's been a hard run for us. <laughs> she is almost 24 and she is thriving. So we did it girl. We did it. Um, uh, I was really sick though. So, and I was gaslit significantly. I was in the medical system as a patient since I was a baby. I was, uh, I was very ill as a child, very, very ill. So I spent my entire life sick. So you can imagine when 2020 rolled around, and especially 2021, when things were going down, um, I could just see the gaslighting happening and I wasn't having it. I just wasn't having it. Like when you have somebody who's been abused by the medical system, and let's throw in that I was sexually assaulted by my doctor when I was 18, 17 actually, repeatedly, and his um, assistants, or I guess we could call them his residents. I think he's dead now. He's an old, he was an old man then. So otherwise I would go back and find him. So, you know, a lot of trauma PTSD and when 2021 specifically and what was happening then was happening, I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> no, nobody's going to tell me what to do with this vessel that I've worked so hard to rebuild. So what you see here is the rebuild. It truly is the rebuild. And it took me a long time and I'm not perfect by any means. And I still have issues. And this is one of the reasons I've been so passionate about GLP-1 agonists lately, because, you know, sometimes we don't all get through the gauntlet in one piece. Sometimes some of us go through a lot and let's throw in some severe adverse childhood events, some significant abuse by a family member growing up. It leads to chronic pain. It leads to autoimmune disease. We know that adverse childhood events leads to chronic pain. Like you're pretty much guaranteed if you had adverse, enough adverse childhood events, you will deal with chronic pain in your life. It reprograms your brain, you know, and your response to things. And we know what sets off autoimmune disease. It's not just the food. We want to focus so much on the food. I've also been living with severe lack of sunlight since I was 14 and moved here to Oregon. So we get a few months of sunlight, but the severe lack of sunlight I know is impacting me in such a absolutely negative way. It's just not conducive to good health and longevity, especially for an autoimmune person. It was no wonder to me that every summer, all of my autoimmune symptoms would go away. My pain would go away. And my face would literally change my entire face. I, I don't want to say structure, but look at me, go look at videos of me in the summer and look at videos of me in the winter. I look like a different person and GLP-1 agonists have given me a leg up and just, you know, microdoses, which I talk about at length inside my new program, which you guys can get on the wait list for. I'll put the link in the show notes for you to get into the free mini course. And then you can, that'll drop you into the wait list for the big course when it comes out again. We've got a hundred people in there we're going through right now and it's awesome. So anyway, all that to say, I have been through it <laughs> and 
I had chronic mold exposure in multiple houses that I was living in and apartments as well. I was sprayed with malathione at length when I was in second grade as a child. A lot of folks, I can't find much on it, but when I go digging, I have found that a lot of thyroid cancer came out of that time period from that area in Northern California. They were spraying for the fruit flies in the early 80s. I remember that the dogs would die. The dogs and cats would die if you left their water and food out. And all the bugs died in my yard. I mean, can you imagine what that did to the ecosystem? All the bugs died. And I've been through it. And I... And then I, you know, add to it, I poisoned myself with cigarettes and bad food. I ate terribly for a long time. Any of you feeling guilt for being addicted to garbage food, trust me, I've been there. You can overcome it. It just takes a lot of discipline. And you just really have to want to live more than you want to eat poison. That's, I don't know how else to say it. I have programmed myself to walk into Starbucks. Well, I won't go into Starbucks anymore, but if I do, I go in and um, I just look at the counter, you know, the or the case of sweets, and I'm like, oh, that's poison. Like I've programmed that into my brain, and it's true, it is. And I, there's you can't argue with me over that because it is, it's garbage. Every pretty much everything in there is garbage. So I overcame all of this, and through the process, I was studying chronic disease and illness through my medical training, and I was going to all the conferences and doing all the extra, you know, curricular CEUs uh, conferences. Then there was webinars and then there, you know, on and on. And I have studied all of this. And I will tell you something. A lot of the doctors treating chronic illness have chronic illness themselves. That's how we got here, right? But I never really got into treating chronic illness because I didn't want to be surrounded by chronically ill people because I was trying to get over it myself. And I realized, you know, one of the reasons I left practice was because it didn't matter what I tried to do. I still ended up with chronically ill people in my clinic. And I particularly specialized in pain, right? I was doing predominantly regenerative injection therapies for musculoskeletal con conditions like prolotherapy, PRP, stem cells. And that was predominantly what I was doing all day, but I still had to help folks with all the other stuff that was going on that was driving their pain, right? And dealing with chronic pain as someone who lives in chronic pain, that's often how my issues present themselves. Chronic pain, remarkable chronic pain that I don't know if many humans uh, could endure. It's exhausting. <laughs> and I mix that up with some lingering viral effects and immunocompromise for years when I was burning the candle at both ends. Like that's one of the reasons I closed my practice as well. I was just too busy. I was traveling. I was probably on a state on an airplane going to get on a stage to at a conference, like at least once or twice a month for years. I was trying to date. I was, you know, single at that point. I was trying to date and, and have a relationship. I had a daughter I was trying to raise by myself. Her father was nowhere to be found. He was not any help. And, and I know I don't say that to be bitter. It was true. And so I was really doing this by myself with really the help of my mother. My mom is just such a hero to me. She's She really has taken, carried the load for me over the years and pulled me out of so many holes. I can't tell you and so I want to share with you all of that to say, I want to share with you what I think about chronic Lyme and chronic mold and parasites and um, long COVID and all of this. I think people, honestly, yes, they have these conditions. And yes, these conditions can be devastating. And yes, absolutely, I have privilege because I have education and I have colleagues and friends and a vast network. So I know how to pull myself out of stuff quickly. And yes, I've been able to quite literally save every single one of my family members' lives at some point because of this knowledge. So I do not say this to be flippant. I have also treated, before I got 100% into regenerative injection therapies, I was treating a ton of chronically ill people in my clinic. They all have something in common. If you go to the passive care model and you expect somebody to apply something to you to get you out of it, it will never work. And the other thing they have in common is they all start to identify with their conditions. I did it too, you guys. I, I wholeheartedly did it. I had cytomegalovirus so bad uh, that it had induced idiothrombocytopenic purpura, which is ITP, which is a uh, bleeding disorder. They have now recategorized it a bit, but it's no longer idiopathic. They know it's autoimmune. <laughs> it's an autoimmune condition where your body attacks your platelets. And I had this starting in my early 20s and it went on through into my late later 20s until I really started paying attention to my health. And then I, it, I eradicated the issue. It's still there, of course. Anything autoimmune is still hanging around. Once the gene's on, it's on. Like 
do not listen to these people who are like, you will reverse your Hashimoto's forever. That's bullshit. You have an autoimmune condition because you turned on a gene and that gene is on. Now you can modulate that gene, but we're not going to like, it's not going to disappear. So anyone who tries to sell you that and try to, to sell you a program because they did it to themselves, they reversed, they, they eradicated, they made their Hashimoto's go away. That's impossible. They still have Hashimoto's. It will come back to bite them in the ass if their health goes sideways again. Just know that. I'm not trying to have anyone lose hope, but just know that like, this is something you have to stay on top of for the rest of your life. So I have enough shit <laughs> that I have to stay on top of it. It is a full-time job for me. And I've made life decisions to pay more attention to my health and less attention to um, exhausting myself into a hole of hell. But that said, when I stopped identifying with my ITP, my ITP started improving. When I stopped identifying with all these chronic issues, they stopped destroying me. That's not to say you can just forget about them and they go away. What I'm saying here is I decided to become more resilient. I decided to take this vessel, this body and rebuild it. And when I shifted my take and my mindset around that, everything changed. When I was just a list of diagnostic codes and I was walking around from one doctor to another, I have Hashimoto's. I have this, I have that. It's like people would come into my clinic and be like, I'm bone on bone and I have Hashimoto's. And I'm like, join the freaking club, lady. Don't we all? <laughs> like you're in good company. <laughs> Very good. How do you want to get over it? Like, where are we? Like, do you want to get past this? Like how motivated are you to stop identifying with that, right? So is when we stop hanging our hat on our diagnoses and we actually start becoming more resilient and doing the work, the full-time work that it is to become more resilient, we improve. Nine times out of 10, people will significantly improve. And even if you're not improving at the pace that you would like, because Lord, I sure don't. I mean, there are times when I'm like, man, the hangups, man, the hangups, man, the injury, man, the setback. It just gets me, right? It gets me down. I'm not my husband. I'm not some of my friends. I don't have the vitality that some of these people have. I don't have the bandwidth. I can't get on a plane all the time. I am exhausted when I come home from a weekend of peopling, too much peopling. And I'm like, ooh, and I have to come home and sleep for a week. It's not because I'm an introvert. It's because I literally just cannot, my nervous system cannot handle that. And I'm okay with it now. It took me until I was 50 years old to really be okay with this. I would say I got quite comfortable in my own skin starting around 40, but I understand what my uh, boundaries are and I don't push past them too often because I will pay for it and I pay for it quickly. And my husband, when I met him in 2019, really, really robust guy and just the vitality and adrenal function of an oxen, you know, and he just glows vitality. Like his microbiome is so good. When I met him, I was like, oh, I want to lick him. <laughs> I just wanted to lick his microbiome. And I don't, do, I do not mean that sexually. I just, he really exudes vitality and I wanted it. Uh, in my, you know, in my atmosphere, in my presence, because we are contagious and good and bad, we are contagious. And so he told me at one point that he's a farmer, you know, he grew up raising cattle and out on a farm. And he was like, you're really durable. And I thought, I called my mom and I'm like, I just got the best compliment of my life. I just had a really vital, healthy, strong, fit guy tell me I was durable. And I was just so you know, oh, I was so grateful for that compliment because I had worked so hard to be durable, you guys. I used to be such a frail, little, brittle mess. You know, I just, my health, I was that girl. Like, I was that girl even as a kid. I was the girl getting allergy shots who couldn't play soccer because I'd go into an asthma attack. I mean, I was that kid. I was sickly all the time. So when people come at me and they're like, you're entitled and you're this and that, I'm just like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. <laughs> like, you have no idea the hell I have endured. And yeah, I've come out the other side and I'm grateful. I have a funny immune system. I don't totally trust it all the time, but man, I trust it a lot more than I used to. So, I just know it's predictably unpredictable, right? That's what I mean. I do trust it. And it's gotten so much better in past years. But step one is becoming more resilient. So I, I don't mean to keep prattling on here and I'll get to the point. Mold is trying to compost you. Chronic viral illnesses are sticking around because you're stagnant. And bacteria and fungus like to overgrow in your body because you're stagnant. 
and chronic Lyme will have a heyday on you if you are not putting yourself through the paces enough to metabolically get hot enough to burn any of these things out. I don't know how to explain it any, any other way. Like mechanistically, you have to get your body metabolically revved up and you have to get it hot. And I've talked about this on past podcasts, but I don't go after the virus. I don't go after the parasite. Yes, we want to kill parasites back, but I'll tell you, interestingly, I don't always kill parasites in patients because we have also looked at the data and in third world countries where they have virtually no autoimmune disease, they have all have parasites. So explain that to me, big parasite people online, because I used to kill every parasite I saw in a patient. I would go after them like it was a war and I would watch some people get sicker and sicker and sicker. And I soon came to realize that sometimes I was just finding them randomly through testing. I wasn't necessarily looking for them. I was just, it was part of a panel and they would show up and that maybe was not actually harming them at all. Maybe it was keeping their immune system in check. And in fact, if you kill off the parasites, it might be what's keeping the immune system overactivation dampened. It might be modulating. I'm not saying that for every parasite. We certainly don't want flukes in our brain and we don't want, you know, there's, there's things we don't want, but not every parasite is pathologic. And you have to look at this through a symbiotic relationship. Not every virus is going to be pathologic in a body. I kept getting messages from people for the past few years, like, why was I not sick? Why was everyone around me sick with this virus? And I wasn't. Um, did I not have it? Like, yeah, you were probably harboring a, a titer of it in your body. You just weren't getting sick because your immune system was handling it. So we have to quit with this really simplistic way of thinking of like, here you are you get exposed to the flu, you're definitely going to get sick. And, you know, even with COVID, people literally thought you were going to die. It was crazy. I was like, what is happening? What is wrong with people? Like logic just went out the door. They thought, so many people thought if you got it, which everybody was going to be exposed. I tried to explain that in 2020. If you got it, you were certainly going to die. No, that's not how it works, you guys. So we want to modulate our homeostasis. We want to modulate our immune system. And getting yourself metabolically revved up is step number one. And I know that exercise intolerance is a huge problem for people when they're chronically ill for various reasons. They could have POTS. They could have, you know, whatever. I mean, COVID, long COVID, Lyme, chronic mold, SIRS, they could have all kinds of things and exercise really flares them up. I just recently had a friend who every time he exercised, he get hives all over his body. And my first question was like, is there mold in your house? So yes, he was being exposed and he was reacting. But if you don't stay metabolically revved up, you are going to get worse. I say this with love and smart exercise physiologists know this and smart doctors who are into exercise physiology know this. And in fact, it, many doctors that I've talked to over the years who have dealt with chronically ill people have said, number one, we have to get them moving. You have to get moving. You can't let the bugs or the mold or whatever it is compost you. They are taking over because you're stagnant. Think of it like a stagnant pond, right? So that's actually step one. It's not blast you with drugs, blast you with expensive herbal uh, concoctions, blast you to make sure that you are pooping out worms. Um, you know, no, it's to get you hot and get you moving. So sauna, even an inexpensive pop-up sauna, Therasage makes an awesome pop-up sauna. I will link it in the show notes. I love it. It's got red light in it. It's a really nice, affordable unit. Having a pop-up sauna, you can even get a blanket sauna. I have a one from Higher Dose I like. I'll share that in the show notes. Get hot. Having a walk-in sauna is preferable. But however you can, get hot. I'll put my sauna links in the show notes so you guys can save. But you got to have something to get you hot. And then you got to start moving. And it's so interesting when I see people post, even data supporting exercise as a way to overcome chronic illness, the comment section is insane. Like people love their chronic illness and they love the excuse of having it. And I say this with love to you because I used to be one of you. I get it. It's so offensive when someone says, you just need to exercise and you're like, I can't get off the floor. How am I supposed to exercise? Well, you know what I did? I crawled. 
I'm not kidding. I have crawled around my house when I couldn't walk. And then I would walk and sit down on the curb every three feet or so. And then I would walk and I would sit down on the curb. But you have got to build your vitality back up. And sauna will help. Sauna can be an exercise, my medic. I don't care if you have any of the conditions I've listed. This is how you start. When my colleagues talk to me and they say, I've got a patient, and she's this old, and she's got all these things wrong with her, and she's so sick, and what would you start her on? What supplements and drugs? And I'm like, dude, I'd get her a sauna and I'd get her exercising. Like that's step one, period, non-negotiable. So for all of you dealing with these conditions, if you are not getting hot and you are not getting metabolically active and moving your body, moving your lymph, moving your blood, moving getting sweaty if you're not doing these things. And again, start with sauna because it's an exercise my medic, but be careful, slow and low for both of these, slow and low. You're not going to go do orange theory. You're not going to go do CrossFit. I have blown my circuits out before trying to be too much, right? Like I'm going to go do this. No, <laughs> sometimes you're not going to go do that. Sometimes you're going to start very slow and low. This cold plunging nonsense of, you know, 30 some degrees up to your neck, like that would kill somebody who is so low vitality and so sick. We do not want to put that kind of stress on the body, but putting your arms and or hands, just hands and feet, just starting hands and feet in a cold bathtub. And then moving up from there, you know, old school naturopathic hydrotherapy uses water. I've talked about this on past episodes, uses water as a tool and we rebuild vitality with alternating hot and cold. So it's a matter of stimulating your system in small increments that are tolerable so that you rebuild your vitality. So that's absolutely step one. And that will get you very far, very fast. Now, if you're regaining your health, and you're decreasing your inflammation by cutting out ultra-refined carbohydrates and cutting out alcohol, making sure you're going to bed on time, making sure you're getting sunlight. Oh my gosh, you guys, I could do a whole podcast on how sunlight would heal you. Just going to the sun can be very therapeutic. But if you're doing all of those things, the bugs don't want to stay in your body. They don't. This is, I have a theory. This is why I think folks in Hawaii are not dying of mold illness to the length that people in Oregon are because people in Hawaii are a in the sun and they're going outside a lot more. And so, gosh, have you been to Hawaii? So many of those structures are so moldy. There's so much mold there. I mean, it's a jungle, right? And those people are not keeling over from mold illness to the extent that we see in other states. And I think sunlight is a huge part of it. I remember when I was chronically ill and I was watching television at my parents' house, I was watching cable. I was so sick and I was so sad. I was so depressed. I didn't, I could not see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I could not imagine enduring life like that at such a young age. I was underweight and I was so ill. So I was watching this program and this guy was chronically ill. He was a young man and he looked terrible. I mean, he was so skinny and he looked like he had Crohn's and he was dying and he lived in France. And in France, they give you like six months to go to the South of France and heal. So he went to the South of France, which is all sunny. And the after pictures were mind blowing. His muscle mass was significantly improved. He was super tan. He was super healthy. And I was like, oh my gosh, the sun is it. And yet here I am still living in Oregon. But I vow to you on this podcast, I will not be living here next winter. I'm not doing it. So I need a winter home, you guys. <laughs> I'm looking at Arizona again. I need a winter home. I got to get out of here. I cannot do this rain. That's it. Sometimes you got to get out of where you are. Sometimes you got to get out of the job you hate. Sometimes you got to get out of the marriage you hate. Sometimes you are living with very sick people and very sick people are contagious and they will put their sickness all over you via their microbiome. They don't mean to. I know it's not intentional, but we have data showing if you live with somebody with cardiovascular disease, your risk for cardiovascular disease goes up. It's not just because of habits. If you are living with somebody with diabetes, your risk for diabetes goes up. It's the biome that they are shedding, that they are sharing with you. It is real and this is not made up data. So heed my warning there. And sometimes you're living in a very sick home that you can't get out of and you need to because it is slowly killing you and it is composting you. That's it. So make sure that if you have parasites or you have SIRS or you have, you know, mold, chronic mold illness, you have chronic Lyme, you have oh gosh, I have a chronic Lyme story for you. I'll share it to finish this up. You very much may need to shift your situation around and 
you definitely need to figure out a way to start getting hot on the regular and you need to find a way to move. I do not have the perfect answer for you. It might be yoga. Uh, yoga was too hard for me. I couldn't even hold my body weight up. I had to get on a Pilates reformer that I was able to move on a Pilates reformer. Um, maybe it is, shoot, I've done yoga and Pilates, not yoga, I should say, but like some sort of like hollow holds. I don't know if you know what holds are, but in gymnastics, it's called a, called a hollow hold. Look it up. I've done that in the bathtub where the water was supporting my weight. So I could just start to get some movement in and start to move my body. You have to start moving your body. And that's the big argument here is that people don't want to do that when they're chronically ill or when they're feeling terrible. But I'm so tired of seeing this huge push to treat chronic illness on social media. It is exhausting because all it is, in my opinion, is perpetuating the problem. And now it's creating neurosis. Now I've got people messaging me constantly saying, I think I have mold. I think I have parasites. I don't know what to do. I saw Dr. So-and-so talking about this. And I'll tell you, Dr. So-and-so is making a killing on their platform off of your misfortune and your neurosis around it. So be cognizant of that. Sometimes we just have to get more robust. While you're at it, consider getting a dog. A dog will get you moving. I promise you. Cats, not so much. Cats are cool, but cats carry to toxoplasmosis. Don't get mad at me. It's true. And toxoplasmosis can make you very, very ill. Um, and if a doctor is trying to kill every parasite in your body, I'm not really sure that's the best idea. Some will argue with me on that, but I'm, I really don't think that's the best idea. But a dog, dogs interestingly do not share pathogens with humans very well. So while a cat may get a form of something that might actually translate to a human more readily, that's not the case so much with dogs. Dogs are pretty cool. Dogs will improve your microbiome. Dogs go out and pick up stuff and bring it in and you get it all over you and it significantly improves your microbiome. We have data on this. Dogs also go out and collect negative electrons. So they come back in, they ground hard on the earth and then they come back in and they help you ground on a regular basis. There are a lot of upsides to dogs. If you have been on the fence about getting one, I highly encourage it and will reap the rewards health-wise. The horror stories you hear are, every time I see one of those, I'm like, that poor person's immune system was probably completely in the toilet and it's a fluke. These are not, dogs actually are amazing. They Their saliva is anti-inflammatory. It's antibacterial. It's antifungal. I did an experiment when I was an undergrad. I swab the mouths of my cat, my dog, my toilet seat, my toothbrush, and my kitchen sponge. And guess what was the dirtiest? The cat's mouth. Cats are ugh. And the dog's mouth was the cleanest next to the human's mouth. Actually, I'm sorry, the human's mouth was the second dirtiest and the dog's mouth was the cleanest and the um, toilet seat was not that dirty. The kitchen sponge was disgusting. <laughs> so whatever you want to do with that information, but just consider that dogs are actually, I think, in multiple ways, very therapeutic for you. And I forgot, I was going to tell you a story of, uh, oh, my Lyme patient. I had a very sick Lyme patient. She was a young woman and she had two young children and she was so skinny and she was so sickly and her joints were swollen up from the Lyme and she was just an absolute mess. She lived in Oregon. And I kept saying, you got to move. You got to get out of here. You got to go to the sun. Well, her house burned down. In Oregon, it was tragic. Her whole they lost everything. Her house burned down, and they had to go move to California, where either her parents or her in laws were, and start over. And I saw a picture of her a year later. She stayed in touch with me over the years, and oh my gosh, I mean, she looked like a new human. And she was like, oh my gosh, the sun moving to the sun was everything, Tina. So I'm gonna move to the sun, and I just wanted to share that with you. You may have to make some tough decisions, and it's not easy. I I know this. I've lived it, but you cannot keep in the same environment, doing the same thing, living the same life and expecting a very expensive supplement protocol with thousands of dollars worth of lab work and a whole functional medicine protocol to fix you. That's not usually the answer. I know you want it to be. And I know all of my friends listening to this who are my colleagues who've practiced that kind of medicine are probably going to be mad at me for saying this, but I just don't think that's the answer. I think invest your money in a sauna, start moving your buns around, get yourself metabolically active, start improving what you're putting in your mouth, make sure that you're prioritizing your sleep, get rid of anybody or anything that stresses the heck out of you. Consider getting a dog and you might have to move. You might have to leave your job. You might have to get the hell out of the state you're living in. And you might definitely have to get out of the apartment or the home that you're living in. 
And that's what I'm going to leave you with. I say all of this with love and I say it with absolute truth and from my own experience and helping many patients through this. So I will see you in the next episode. 